All right, so moving on. Apologize for all the uh, dry, basic, entry-level stuff there. We'll, hopefully the rubber will meet the road here and we'll actually look at asterisks. The goals of this module are to understand the, uh, the basic component uh, architecture of asterisks, the, the, uh, the different modules that provide all the capability in asterisks, including um, you know, the, uh, the different ways of interfacing with asterisks, like the AMI and AGI gateways. Um, as well as the, uh, the human interface to asterisks, we'll look at some uh, basics and best practices uh, for using the CLI and how to, to better administer the, the PBX while looking at the, uh, the, the live dial plan, for example, and how that contrasts to what might be in extensions.conf. You might be familiar with how uh, some of the stuff that's loaded in the dial plan will be coming from other places, not just extensions.conf proper. And of course, that'll be uh, <clears throat> different if you're using, instead of flat config files, uh, uh, real time for your, uh, for your configuration storage. We'll, we'll look at the basics of uh, how to install asterisks with the, the, within the Linux file system and some of the places that the asterisk stuff goes, you know, asterisk sounds and uh, the, uh, the modules that make up asterisk, uh, where the voicemail goes. And, uh, and then we'll look at the, the top five configuration files of asterisks like zip.conf, eeks.conf, and uh, what's called dotty.conf. Dotty, for those who aren't familiar, is an acronym D-A-H-D-I, which is um, an acronym we made up because Zaptel was uh, trademarked and, and uh, stands for what? Digium Hardware Inter Device Interface. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I think there was like an internal uh, uh, contest at Digium just to, to you know, come up with the name that we would use to replace it. So that was what won. And uh, we like making an inside joke to Digium about having dotty issues. Anyways. <laughs> Asterix runs on uh, a number of platforms, uh, primarily, of course, Linux, and that's uh, as far as the community goes and, um, uh, and the, you know, subscription or commercial support for Asterix, the only uh, platform that's really supported, but uh, does run on BSD, uh, Solaris, and OSX. It uh, still works on 2.4 and, of course, 2.6 kernels, and uh, Hopefully, okay, you can see that pretty well. The, uh, <clears throat> the core of the, uh, the asterisk system is, a, is that hockey puck you see there, the, the dial plan. And uh, when, when asterisk loads, if you start asterisk without any, any functionality built in, if you don't load any of the, the modules, then the, the PBX uh, core can essentially do a couple of things, like provide timing and uh, allow for modules to be loaded in the configuration relative to that module to be parsed and, and applied. And uh, we'll look at uh, all the different modules provided with asterisks in a default installation in just a second. But some examples are uh, modules for the channel drivers. So that's both the hardware driver, Dotty, as I mentioned, and uh, SIP, EECS, H323, MGCP, Unistem, pretty much everything you can, can, uh, would want. And then there's uh, separate modules that provide capability both for, for codec translation, uh, that is, you know, translation for the media stream from one codec to another, ULAW to GSM, G79, et cetera, as well as file formats for the same codec. So you can record uh, voicemail, GSM, WAV, et cetera, uh, and record your own sound prompts, whatever the case may be. And then uh, there are a number of drivers for uh, the, uh, the um, drivers for the, the database integration I mentioned earlier, where you've, you can have real-time architecture where you can store uh, voicemail in a database, you can store your configuration, like the dial plan and, you, and your SIP config, where you might have uh, hundreds and perhaps thousands of endpoints configured. That would be perhaps cumbersome and, and uh, unwieldy to do uh, in a, just a static configuration file. So there are a number of uh, drivers there. And then <clears throat> what makes up the, 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 the dial plan capability are um, the applications, resources, and, and functions. So you'll see there are a number of uh, application modules, app dial, app hang up, et cetera, and as well as resources. And then there's, there's other modules that provide those 
uh, interfaces to Asterix I mentioned, the CLI and the capability at the CLI to originate calls, hang up calls, destroy channels, um, you know, make changes on the fly to the dial plan, and then the, the machine interface for Asterix, AMI, the manager interface, and uh, the AGI. So again, the, the, the core itself is, is the, the, the heart of Asterix that just provides the basics, um, system timing, and the ability to, to parse this configuration, and all of the other capabilities, the discrete uh, codec functionality, uh, channel drivers, et cetera, are provided by uh, individual modules, which are shared objects, uh, .so file, kind of like a DLL in Windows. And the, the syntax, or the naming of these files is, as you see, I lost my pointer. Where you've got uh, chan underscore sip dot so, so for shared object. And uh, the, the prefix here should be indicative of the module type. So app underscore dial, um, codec underscore GSM, et cetera. Now one thing to, uh, to be aware of, and this, this won't play in uh, early on in your installation, but it's, it's good to, to at least have some fami familiarity with. The, um, the applications themselves typically are loaded synchronously and uh, loaded by those discrete modules like you see there, like app meet me. And there are certain resources like um, res music on hold that when loaded and uh, uh, parsed by the, the, the asterisk core will dynamically load into memory a number of relevant uh, applications as well that don't have a associated application module. So there'll be an app music on hold as well that you can reference from the dial plan, which doesn't really provide a lot of capability. It, for those who are familiar, it, it really is essentially a way of invoking music on hold from the dial plan, perhaps for testing capabilities. But again, that, that application actually doesn't have its own discrete uh, module. So just be aware of that. And uh, <clears throat> again, there's, there's a number of resources that are, uh, that are accessible uh, in Asterix. And these are a little bit different than the applications where a resource is a, is a functionality that can be sort of hooked into by a number of different applications or parts of Asterix at any given time. So the music on hold resource is, is running and can be configured in its own configuration file, musiconhold.conf. And you can, you can change there the, the format type to use. Do you want to use MP3 or do you want to use uh, uh, music on hold or music files that are in the same format that uh, you've chosen as your default or preferred codec for your internal endpoints? And um, you, you know, music on hold can be accessed by applications like Dial. One option to the Dial application will allow the user to hear music on hold as well instead of ring back. So again, that, that resource is, is um, being attached to by a number of different uh, components and asterisks at one time. As I said, there's, there are a number of uh, codecs available in asterisk. This is one thing that is uh, uh, constantly changing in asterisk. The, the codec capabilities in 1.8 were enhanced to add some wideband and ultra-wideband codecs, and uh, there will be more available in asterisk 10. Asterisk 10, by the way, if you guys haven't seen the announcements or the, the blog posts on digium.com, there is a, a, at least a one release candidate on asterisk.org, right? So you can, uh, you can check out asterisk 10 now and start playing around with it, and there's a lot of cool uh, features available. Um, but again, the, the codec module is used for uh, interfacing with the, the, the media stream, and the similar format driver is for actually storing that audio on the local file system. So if you wanted to record, uh, you know, for recording voicemail or actually call recording in general, recording queue calls, recording emergency messages, et cetera. So there are a number of, uh, basically any, f any codec capability, there's gonna be a format module associated with it. And this all depends again on, on what you choose at installation. All this stuff, um, or pretty much all of it, uh, depending on the dependencies on your machine, will be installed, and we'll look at the installation process here in a second, and you'll see that you can go in and you can choose uh, modules to exclude so you can have a more slimmed down um, installation. Uh, 
And that can be beneficial for a number of reasons. Otherwise, uh, or in general, uh, a smaller footprint, so uh, less system resources needed. And one important reason uh, we like to show um, using the, uh, the menu select system to uh, deselect modules to, to not install them is for security reasons. Uh, but we'll look at that in a, in a little bit. Uh, and the command line interface is super important. Um, we always harp on this in our instructor-led classes and insist on kind of having the uh, terminal open at all times and hooked up to the CLI so we can see what's going on. You know, if you have a problem, you make a call, you get it fast busy. Uh, it's difficult to, to troubleshoot and diagnose. You want to look at what's going on in the CLI and see what errors, warnings, you know, other system messages are, are coming up. And that's really uh, where you can um, do everything. Again, I mentioned you can, you can originate calls from the CLI, hang up calls, add channels, destroy channels. You can um, uh, modify the dial plan. You can uh, view the dial plan and, and uh, using uh, the proper syntax, see where a particular call will route through your dial plan logic. And uh, it's a good way to see if you've got multiple pattern matches, what the actual sort order was that Asterix used to, uh, to load those extensions. And, uh, and one major benefit of the, the CLI is the inline help. So if you're not familiar with the different options for a particular application, one good example is, uh, is app dial. Actually, I'm going to hook up to the, to the CLI on this box real quick to show you what I'm talking about. Oh, killed the connection. Yeah, I'm running Windows. It's a company laptop, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, I saw that earlier and I changed it and I didn't save it apparently, so. Bear with me. Now I'll save it and open it and that should work. Okay, can you read that? Okay, so we'll look at this syntax again, how to connect to the CLI, but what I wanted to show you was the valuable inline help here, and also tell you guys about the wiki. So from the CLI, you can, you can see all the, the syntax help and the options and arguments available for an application like Dial, by far the most common application in Asterix. Um, core, show, application, and I'll tab complete here. You can see all, like, I think there's 140 something applications available in Asterix. Tons of stuff here. Look at the output, output for dial, and you can see it explains all the different options. I'm going to scroll up to the top here. Uh, whoops. Oh, I should have used uh, dash R so you could see the special characters. Um, yeah, that looks nasty. Dash R? Yeah, okay, here we go. So, why is it, it's wrapping? Uh, here we go. Okay, so you can see the, the, the syntax is, is explained, um, where you reference it in the dial plan. The, uh, the arguments go in the parentheses here, and the, the argument syntax for um, addressing either a, a endpoint, you know, whether that's a, um, a phone, like we're going to configure these phones in a second, and both the dial plan and in, in uh, sip.conf, you do address the, the technology, so that would be uh, sip slash resource, like phone dash one, and then you can set a number of options and a timeout. Uh, I think the timeout 
it says here if you don't specify one, is 136 years. So <laughs> just enough time to, to get them to answer the phone. Um, but yeah, you can see that there's like 30 something different options that uh, you can use with, with the application, a lot of information here. Now what I wanted to bring up as well, I mentioned was the, the wiki. So you've got a lot of resources here, um, we'll connect back to Asterix. Likewise for the, the functions, so like uh, fun applications are used for actually um, modif affecting a call. So impacting the call directly, you know, like app dial, actually initiating a call, bridging calls, app hang up, you know, th those things affect the call. Uh, functions are kind of like super variables where you can get and set channel data. So one very common example is the function caller ID. And the uh, syntax is always uppercase. And you can see here, this is asterisk 1.8, and there's a lot more data types available in 1.8 over 1.6. I think there's like 32 different data types here. But pretty much what you would typically do is um, set uh, either all, name, and num to override caller ID if you want to spoof caller ID or if you want to uh, uh, change caller ID on your business PBX to you know, just the main billing number instead of your, your extension. That's something that we, had a, we have a feature like that in our PBX. If you dial 9 to get out, you know, what the, uh, the far side user will see is your, you know, your extension so that they can call back directly to your DID and get you. Or you can dial 7 to get out and it just you know, masks it with the main number. So that way they just get you know, your IVR. Um, but what I wanted to mention was now there is a new wiki. I think it was released uh, October of last year. Very valuable resource, wiki.asterix.org. Sorry, my Wi-Fi is pretty slow. Anyone use the wiki? No, no one. There you go. Um, it's uh, pretty valuable, and uh, there are a lot of. Uh, oh. Okay, maybe I don't have connection anymore. It's been kind of intermittent throughout the day. But uh, what I wanted to show you, if it, if it actually loads, is that um, there's a bot that any time the, uh, the, the code is changed relative to, to an application or function or an AGI command, you know, the syntax changes, an option is added, et cetera, then that will uh, be added automatically to the wiki and, up, and updated. Um, anyone familiar with uh, VoIP info? VoIPinfo.org, yeah, use that as a pretty common resource. And it's a wiki as well, and uh, has been around for quite a while, and uh, I still use it once in a while. And um, the, the problem there is some of the information, as you guys are familiar with, uh, it's out of date. You know, there'll be information there, syntax for, for asterisk 1.0, you know, things like the X1.0 or X1 version that's no longer applicable, you know, not compatible with X2, it doesn't even use the same port. Um, so the information there can be out of date unless people are being diligent in, uh, in changing it. But the, the wiki, um, let's see, there you go. If you, if you drill down to the Asterix project, <coughs> command reference, dial plan application, go to app, And there we go, the same deal, the, the description and the different uh, relevant um, syntax. Uh, if applications create uh, asterisk uh, um, channel variables, like uh, dial status is a very common one used in, in a lot of applications where after the dial is either attempted or completed, the dial status variable is set to one of these um, options by asterisk and you can reference that variable to, to enhance your dial plan logic. So a common example there that you might see in like the, uh, the different asterisk books are um, creating a, a couple of extensions where based on the, the status, if it was busy, you go to voicemail where they get the busy message. And if they're unavailable otherwise, uh, get the unavailable message. So um, if anything were to change in this application, 
in the development of Asterix, it would automatically, automatically be updated here. And of course, there's a lot of other resources in this wiki, um, like the Asterix 10 documentation here are just articles that developers and other community members submit explaining and, and documenting stuff in Asterix. Um, as with a lot of open source projects, documentation can be problematic and can be lacking in a lot of places. And uh, recently, um, and it's always been the case, you know, it's with the, the O'Reilly book and everything, um, there's been some uh, good enhancements in documentation with the Asterix project. So um, you, can, you can create an account and also contribute to the wiki if, if there's anything that you see missing um, or that's not explained thoroughly. Uh, you can contribute to the community in that way as well, providing documentation. That's something that a lot of people don't see is very exciting but can be very, very useful. So there you go. That's the new wiki. Oops. Oh, let me. While we're here, I was mentioning the uh, the value of the the CLI. If we look at the the output of the dial plan show, this shows the the dial plan currently loaded in memory. We're going to look at the basic syntax here. What um, how we can create extensions in, uh, here we go. What I wanted you to see here is that um, this extension here, 730, and referencing the application park, was added by features.conf. Okay, just one, one quick example of how um, your dial plan is not one for one related to extensions.conf proper or, you know, pound include files that might be concatenated in there. Um, so uh, this is one problem I see either in class or when I'm supporting people or uh, consulting, people will be looking at sip.conf and it's like, you know, I see it there, but I look in asterisk and it's not there. Well, you forgot to do sip reload and apply that uh, to, the, to the running installation. So um, always use the CLI as reference. That's your human interface to, to asterisk and that's where you can see what's actually going on. And uh, that one pro tip alone, I think, helps a lot of people uh, when they're first starting out. Moving on here. There's also the manager interface. That, uh, the syntax for the AMI commands you might have seen uh, is available there at the, uh, the wiki that you can use. Uh, and to build um, computer integration to, to Asterix to, to issue the same commands, uh, but much more quickly than you would by hand, and the AMI is, is often used by a, a number of, of uh, different people for in-house applications for just um, quick stats, you know, seeing um, hold times or like what people or their agents are doing. And uh, like uh, click, to, click to dial applications is one real common use of the AMI. And uh, a lot of the uh, GUIs that people use, you might you might notice if you use like FreePBX or Trixbox, if you're on the CLI, you'll see AMI connections happening a lot because the GUI is sending AMI commands and these are polling asterisks or sending, sending commands to asterisk. So also there is the AGI. We, we, again, we, we cover the AGI and AMI in great depth in our asterisk advanced class and uh, do a number of examples and, and demos where we where we configure stuff with, with both of these interfaces. AGI is the, the gateway interface for Asterix, kind of like uh, uh, CGI for, for, for web stuff. And this is a, a way where people um, essentially add capability to the dial plan that's not otherwise provided by the applications or, or doesn't typically apply to call flow. Okay, so if it's not something where you're, you're talking about doing an IVR, but instead you're actually um, going into a, your customer database, maybe to do a basic screen pop application, you know, pull your database, get their information based on the caller ID from, from the inbound call, and then, and then load that in like Sugar CRM or, or Salesforce or something. Um, AGI scripts are used for that. And, it, and essentially the, the AGI um, family of applications is a way of running or accessing a script either on the local machine or another machine to, uh, ba built in pretty much any uh, language that you can think of, and in, in Bash script included. Um, anyone here develop AGI for their applications? Yeah. 
Okay. Is that uh, for um, in-house stuff, or is that a product that uses AGI? Okay. What, uh, what kind of application is it? Can you talk about it? Or? Okay. All right, now, again, uh, traditionally there's gonna be the two different ways that you can configure asterisk. The, the, the standard way, the, the, the simple way to configure asterisk and what we'll be using for our, our basic demo purposes in this seminar is configuring asterisk using uh, just the flat configuration files, just ASCII text files. And uh, if you run make samples, there are quite a few of those that go to Etsy asterisk. So we'll look at that real quick. See what I'm talking about? There's just a ton of them. See. Extensions.com where you can configure the, uh, the dial plane. You've got uh, configuration files for each of your protocols, eeks.conf, sip.conf. Um, voicemail.conf, there's uh, meetme.conf, uh, dotty-channels, this is uh, uh, an add-on where, uh, where we, Chan Dotty, here we go. This is where we configure the, the hardware interface for Asterix. So just a, a bunch of uh, configuration files here. And what's very valuable when you, when you uh, we'll look at this again in a second when we actually go through the installation, but if you make these sample configuration files, these are actually, um, I think this one is actually, we we'll could look at Chan.A. I think the stuff is still in there. Nope. I emptied them out because we're going to use them for a, for a demo. What, uh, we'll look at eeks.com. Okay, here we go. See, when you make samples, the contents of the file um, is heavily commented, and this is all the documentation you need for, for that particular configuration. So all the different options and, uh, and the purpose of the option, and if an option is, uh, or, well, okay, and let's go down to the bottom here. There's a couple of example trunks. Okay, so the, the basic syntax of, of, our, of our core configuration files is gonna look like this. The, there's a, um, the highest organizational unit will always be in, in uh, square brackets, like the general section where you configure global options. And then uh, subsections, likewise, will be a uh, particular label contained in the square brackets. And then you have a key value pair where there's the option, like type, and uh, you know different types and asterisks, user, friend, and peer. And so all the different options relative to that, uh, are documented up here. So the valid values for auto kill, you know, down here. And a number of the, the options will be the same for all the different protocols, if they're like uh, uh, for codex, you know, you allow equals G729, et cetera, disallow, GSM, that'll be the same from protocol to protocol. But, uh, okay. As you saw, all of those files installed by default will go to uh, Etsy asterisk. Um, the, the typical Linux hierarchy uh, will, you know, will have uh, configuration files and uh, configuration components in the slash etc or etsy directory and asterisk included. So you're going to have a, a subdirectory there for asterisk. And if you install the Dotty package, which can be uh, Dotty, typically Dotty Linux complete, which installs the Dotty drivers as well as all the Dotty tools, there'll be a, a, a directory there as well, slash etc slash dahdi. But all those files have pretty much the same syntax. Whoops, excuse me. Uh, blah.conf, C-O-N-F, for config. And uh, you, you might have noticed that the comments there with all the, the sample inline help um, is the, uh, the semicolon. Uh, typically, in an, a Linux installation, the, uh, the comment character will be hash. But in asterisk, we use uh, semicolon because we'll actually be using hash in our configuration. You know, like for, for feature codes, for example, we wouldn't want that to, to look like a, uh, a comment. So uh, keep that in mind if you're going to be using Dotty for your interface. In the Dotty config that, that lives elsewhere in slash etc slash Dotty, that'll be commented with the, with the, the hash as usual. So the, the syntax between those two will be a little bit different. 
And uh, as we go through the installation, and I'll, I'll mention this now, we actually recommend not as a, um, a best practice, but just as a, a, a way to make things simpler for yourselves. Uh, in any asterisk installation, go ahead and install Dottie as well, even if you're not going to be using hardware interfaces, because depending on the kernel or the machine that you're using, uh, there may be different uh, timing resources available, and timing is going to be quite important for the phone system for uh, syncing audio streams and call recording, RTP, uh, conferencing, you know, all that's going to really depend on having a good timing source. But if you install Dottie, you guarantee to have at least one timing source. So it's just kind of a good rule of thumb. As I mentioned in the configuration files, the, uh, the syntax is pretty much always going to look like this, where you've got a section heading in square brackets and then uh, a key value pair that actually applies the option, comments with the, with the semicolon. And uh, you, if you want to do a block comment, comment several lines at the same time, you can use uh, semicolon dash dash and close that with dash dash semicolon. So um, that is also a, a something that uh, is worth noting. Anyone uh, who's any kind of developer, scripting or otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a good idea to, to comment your code. And uh, it's really helpful to comment your dial plan and other configuration as well in Asterisk. So if other administrator, administrators are coming behind you, they know that what you were trying to do. So, so add comments. Um, but really, what we're going to kind of breeze through is the basics of, again, these five configuration files. That's asterisk.conf. Asterisk.conf is kind of, is kind of the, the, the core configuration file where you can set um, uh, the basics of like uh, where things will go on the file system, where the sound files will go, et cetera. Um, SIP.conf and eeks.conf, these are the, uh, the, the most commonly used uh, and the most well-supported uh, protocols in Asterisk and uh, the most uh, continually developed uh, protocols. There are, of course, uh, other, or other protocols, including sort of reverse-engineered proprietary protocols like Unistim. And then Chan underscore Dottie, the syntax is a little bit unique there. I don't know why, sort of obnoxious. But that's the configuration files where we configure um, the interface for all of our hardware. So both analog and digital termination will be configured there. And again, extensions.conf. Extensions is where most of your call flow logic will be applied. If it's, if it's where you're going to be originating calls or uh, uh, providing inbound call logic, IVR, auto attendant, et cetera, that's where you're going to be uh, configuring that. Uh, for existing calls, if you, have, uh, if you want to add feature codes for a bridged call, like hitting star one to transfer a call or for uh, allowing um, users to enable call recording or any number of features, that's configured separately in features.conf. But otherwise, most everything will be configured here in extensions.conf. So um, once we get through the basics of the installation, we'll pretty much be spending most of our time, in, especially in sessions three and four, just in extensions.conf, looking at the different applications and functions. And then we'll look at uh, how to use like channel variables and expressions, do some conditional branching, and just have fun with the dial plan. And at that point, if you have any particular questions, especially as it applies to, to your installation, hopefully we can kind of just hack it out together on the, uh, on the screen. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, asterisk.conf is where you can, you can set the, the, the locations on the the local file system where Asterix will store things like the, the configuration files, sounds, voicemail, et cetera. But also, typically, especially when you're new to Asterix, keep this in mind. Uh, you can use this as reference to just go check if you can't remember uh, where the sound files go. You know, is it var spool or is it user lib? I forget. You know, check asterix.conf. But you can set other global options applicable there, like um, initializing uh, uh, cryptography cryptography keys, uh, uh, keys for um, like uh, Dundee. You can globally set that there instead of having to connect to the CLI and initialize it then. It'll just happen every time you, you start asterisk. SIP.conf, um, I have the left blank here so that we can go in together and start adding endpoints instead of having all that inline help. It's, uh, of course, 
where we configure SIP capability, and that's um, all types of endpoints. So first of all, you're gonna have the general section again, that's uh, where we set global options. Um, you can change the, the port used for SIP capability to the asterisk server there. Uh, you can set any number of options such as the CODA capability. Again, that's allow equals blah, and that will be inherited by the, the other sections below that. But if you wanna add a trunk to an ITSP or a phone, any, any SIP account that you're gonna configure in Asterix will be in its own discrete subsection below the general section. And again, all you have to do is label it in the square brackets, and then uh, the options will be applied as the key value pair, blah equals yes, or you know, uh, uh, like qualify equals yes is a good example. Qualify um, for an endpoint will allow you to to see on the CLI, there's a number of actual benefits of doing that, but if you look on the CLI SIP show peers, you can see the latency from asterisk to that endpoint round trip uh, SIP latency. It uses a SIP options message instead of a ICMP message. So the actual uh, latency for the SIP traffic will be represented there. So that's a pretty useful option. And a lot, again, a lot of those options uh, are gonna be the same from, from VoIP protocol to VoIP protocol. Uh, there will be options that are unique to that particular protocol. For example, trunk equals yes and eeks. Does anyone use eeks? Do they have multi-site installations or eeks termination to an ITSP? Okay. And uh, are you using it to an ITSP or are you using multiple sites and eeks in between? Okay. And are you using trunking? Yes. Okay. See, um, uh, it's, a, it's a significant benefit, I'm sure, right? How many concurrent calls do you typically have going between sites? Uh, well, right now, about Okay. Well, um, it really, of course, depending on the, the codec you're using and the, the bandwidth that it takes and a couple other factors then, and other options relative to that, the trunk option in EECS is, uh, is pretty killer and one of the reasons people use EECS instead of SIP. And again, this is typically applicable to multi-site installations. It is the inner asterisk exchange protocol, after all, and that's what its intended purpose is. And, uh, and it's kind of a, a fluid thing, I think, I guess the, the developers call the current version EEX 2.5 uh, when they, they added some security options to EEX. It uh, did sort of change the, the, the protocol from what is in the, the EEX uh, standard. I think, uh, what is the RFC 45? No, no, 4569 four, is a port. I think it's 5456, I think that's it. You can Google it. But uh, that being the case, EEX, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of vendor adoption as far as you know EEX uh, hard phones because you know if it's going to keep changing as as asterisk changes then that would be something that a vendor wouldn't typically want to do but at some point you know the the EEX protocol should mature I think they'll have like a version three hopefully at least and then you know there might be more EEX hard phones but there are a number of EEX soft phones and and web uh, clients available so actually you know, endpoint termination. And that can be very valuable if you've got uh, remote endpoints that have problem connecting over NAT, you know, NAT traversal, pretty common and an annoying problem with SIP. If, uh, if that person is typically using a soft client, then using a eek soft client like, like uh, Zoiper being one of them, uh, that can, can take care of the, the problem with, with NAT traversal just by switching the protocol. So that's one other benefit of eeks. Again, Chan Dottie Conf is where we configure all of the Dottie interface stuff. Um, so any digital or analog uh, connectivity. It's a little bit different. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to demo this, but uh, you kind of have to, to configure the different layers. And to start, we would actually configure etsy.dottiesystem.conf. This is where we actually configure the drivers and, and the options for the hardware itself. Get the hardware loaded and apply, and apply that configuration to the hardware. Once that's done, you know, configuring the analog card to properly use uh, loop start signaling, you'll likewise configure the same channel for Asterix to use it, if that's what you want, um, in uh, chan.conf. Again, or, or to be clear, our Dottie hardware that we make at Digium and any other like Sangoma, or there's, there's a lot of hardware that Asterix can use. Um, 
doesn't have to be used with asterisks. You can use it for a number of different purposes, but um, if you're going to configure those channels and asterisks, you do have to configure it in chan.aconf and then restart asterisks to apply those changes. The syntax there is a, is a little bit different. Um, and, and newer versions of asterisks, of course, actually in 162 and higher, I think, you can configure discrete sections for groups of channels under the square brackets, just like in your VoIP protocol. So it's, uh, it's more intuitive and doesn't confuse uh, between the two uh, configuration files. And then there's extensions.conf. This is, again, the, the, the meat of the asterisk configuration. This is where we configure the real call flow, um, incoming and outgoing calls, pretty much everything. This is something that if you're new to asterisks, and the students I've seen in, in our classes who, who are using it for the first time, um, they expect configuration for certain functionality to be configured discreetly, um, like uh, an IVR configuration file or an IVR uh, GUI, and that's not the case. Uh, to build an IVR, or, or to be more specific, you know, to build an auto attended inside Asterix, it's all just combining applications and functions and all the, the components of the dial plan it's more like a scripting language. And we'll look at the basic syntax of that scripting language. So if you've not used that, if you've maybe been using asterisks through a GUI, like FreePBX, if you want to know how it works under the hood, you should be able to take that away with you today and be able to kind of mess around with your asterisk system um, right at the, the configuration file level. So again, the basic architecture of asterisks, what, what comes with a, a default asterisk installation are the, uh, the different levels of interface, so CLI, AMI, and AGI. And uh, by default, we'll be installing all of the channels, you know, the, uh, the, the protocols, the protocol capability with asterisks, resources, and applications. Again, those are, those are components of the dial plan. Now, moving on to the installation, we'll see how that looks. Um, and I'll, I'll go through and show you the, the menu select um, and curses menu. Um, what we're going to look at here is we'll briefly discuss the different ways that you can install asterisks, you know, installing through uh, a, a package like, like Trixbox, installing natively or vanilla installation, such as uh, um, we prefer doing in our, in our classes using uh, the vanilla tarballs. We'll just download those from asterisks.org. And, uh, and then you can, you can download and install through your, uh, your repositories and your, your, uh, whatever distro you're using. And uh, if you're going to do that, actually, I'd recommend there's a number of repositories provided by the, the Asterix community. And if you go to the downloads.asterix.org page, I think there's a, actually, let's take a look at that real quick here. Hopefully it won't go too slow. Okay, you can see here that you can get the packages for CentOS, Debian, and Ubuntu. And so you go to this page and follow the, uh, the instructions for adding the repos. Um, okay. And in that way, instead of like, if you're running a, a, a stable version of Debian and you were to go and try and install Asterix, you know, apt get install Asterix, it might install depending on you know, the version of Debian, a really old version of Asterix, which might not be supported by the community or, or Digium under a subscription or anything like that. You wouldn't want to install Asterix 1.2 accidentally, um, especially if that's the first time you want to most likely be using the current version, uh, the release version at least, like 1.8. So uh, it would be beneficial to you to, to add that repository so you're getting sort of the vanilla official version of Asterix and installing it from the repo. And before uh, one six, or rather before one eight, there is a separate asterisk add-ons package. This uh, this package is is uh, provided separately, not for technical reasons, but for a number of different licensing reasons. Where um, there, there's a, a conflict, and we can't package like like MP3 channel capability uh, or coda capability with asterisk proper. So that's in a um, a separate tarball, including, oh, and, and the MySQL connector uh, for storing your configuration or voicemail in, in a, a SQL database. In 1.8, that's actually part of the, um, the main tarball, and I have that on this machine. So if we go to, it's 1.8. 
Might five. We'll make menu select. The a top level option in this menu is actually called add-ons. So didn't work. Hmm. Oh well. Okay. Well, I think there's another version of Astro. No. Okay. We'll go back to that. Run that. Let it go. Do its thing. Might take a second because that's a slow box. Um, but yeah, um, there's a there's a top level option called add-ons, and none of the packages in that um, menu tree I think are selected by default. But you can go in there and and uh, select to enable. You know, if you want to have the 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 codec capability or the format for MP3. So uh, that's a common one people like to use, of course, for their uh, music on hold. Sorry. Okay, so a little bit about the, the development uh, cycle whoops, of Asterix. Asterix uh, developers use the revision control system subversion and In a nutshell, what happens is the, the Asterix uh, developers will decide, you know, for the forthcoming version of uh, Asterix, I think that'll actually happen here for the, the next version of Asterix at the, the Asterix DevCon um, going on, I think today. When's the DevCon happen? Yeah, okay. So, you know, the, the community decides a particular feature set that they're, they're, they're looking to develop and, you know, they kind of identify what, what that's going to be. Start developing and that's going to be the development uh, trunk. Those who have commit access or are adding patches provided by other people are contributing to what's called trunk. And the development trunk, again, like I mentioned, we were actually using that as our production machine back in the day, is going to it's typically very unstable. You know, it's always going to be different depending on what people are adding and uh, can be broken at any time. But when that development trunk you know, is decided that it's at a particular level of maturity, that'll be branched off into uh, like, you know, version 1.4. 1 1.6, there's actually sub-branches 1.6.0, 1.6.1, and 1.6.2, um, an, an experiment for uh, having quicker release cycles where each of those sub-branches added their own uh, feature sets. So, you know, you could have a, a, a long-term support version of Asterix, so people using it in the enterprise where they don't intend to mess around with it or change their feature set very option and want something stable would use that. But if people are using it for other reasons where they want uh, to quickly be able to change the version of Asterix and uh, get those extra features, they could do that. Um, but once a, once a branch is uh, branched off, then the, the code is, uh, at that point, they're going to be adding bug fixes, et cetera, to, to stabilize the branch before there's going to be a tarball release, an actual you know, uh, ver point release, a version release of Asterix, so 1.8.0, for example. And uh, before that, as you'll see on asterisk.org, there will be release candidates and then, and then beta versions that you can check out. If you use a subversion client, you can check out a branch or the development trunk. And uh, that could be beneficial for, for one reason in particular. If, if you're using asterisk in your installation and uh, you've identified a bug. You've submitted the bug yourself and got feedback from the community, and there's been a patch applied that can fix that. And it's a, it's a critical bug that might be affecting uh, Asterix where uh, you know, it's crashing or channels are hanging open, et cetera. Then you can use a, your subversion client and check out the, uh, the, uh, the branch, uh, the, the current uh, release, or the, there's a release number that'll be associated with the, uh, the, the patch. It should be um, in the bug tracker um, attached to that patch. So you can actually use a version to, to check out that particular revision number and, and then apply that to your Asterix installation instead of waiting, you know, perhaps months before there's another point release and then download the tarball directly. So if you've got a problem that has to be resolved immediately and you know that and you've identified a patch that fixes it, 
um, using a subversion branch um, is okay in production, but we typically advise using a, a stable release in production and, of course, never using the trunk uh, version in production because that could be um, totally unstable. That was always fun when we were using in, in, our, in, a, in our call center at Digium. I mentioned uh, installing Dottie earlier along with, with Asterix. You can download Dottie um, at uh, asterix.org as well if we go to downloads.asterix.org. Telephony. And you see here there's the Asterix GUI, Asterix proper, and there's a couple of different Dottie subdirectories here. There's Dottie Linux and Dottie Tools. Dottie Linux is just the package of drivers for Dottie hardware. Um, so the analog cards, T1 cards, transcoder cards, um, and other products that interface with the Dottie channel driver. And then Dottie Tools. Dottie Tools provides a number of things. You have a question? I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Dottie, Dottie Tools adds interfaces to manipulate Dottie, change configuration, run uh, Dottie Maint is a, is a pretty cool tool where you can do software loopback tests on your T1s. So you can uh, test it at the interface to see if the card is bad, or you can do a, um, a, a test that goes through the framing chip in the card to see to, to try and figure out if there's a problem with the cable, problem with the provider, or the, the card might be bad. Um, there's a Dottie tool is actually one of the tools that um, you can use to see the status of your, your T1 lines, the, um, if it's what alarm state it's in, red alarm, yellow alarm, blue alarm. And all these tools are very valuable. You can also use these to, to record on the line. You can use a, a Dottie monitor to, to record pre-echo cancellation and post-echo cancellation. And that can be super valuable if you're having uh, intermittent echo issues. And so uh, typically you want both of those things, and that's what Dottie Linux Complete is. Dottie Linux Complete is just the, uh, the combination of both Dottie Linux and Dottie Tools. So we pretty much always just say download Dottie Linux Complete. There's usually not a reason to have to download those things separately. Um, so there's some new stuff in Dottie 2.5, by the way. If you guys are using Dottie and you haven't updated in a while, finally, after a really long time, you can, uh, you can actually log uh, bit state changes when you're on a CAS or channel, channelized T1. So if anyone is actually still using that, like ENM or FXO or FXS T1, you can, you can see when calls are initiated and when the line is, is seized, what the, the bit states are. And you can contrast or compare that to the standard to see if there's a problem. And you can identify if the problem is with asterisk or with the provider. Before, what we'd have to do is actually watch that uh, dotty tool. I'll pull it up here real quick. Select a card, and uh, you would, uh, you would in, a, in a T1, they would show you all the channels here, 1 through 24, and then the, the, the bit states down below here. And you'd have to just like watch and see them quickly change on the screen and, see and, and catch it, and it was very, uh, very obnoxious to troubleshoot. So finally, that's available as no one uses CAS anymore. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I mean... I'm not being, I mean, I know that sounded condescending, yeah, but I'm happy about it because I really hated supporting e and There's no, like, standardization. Um, who, anyone using termination not between uh, their legacy PBX and asterisk, but actually still have sites using CAS T1? Just, just curious. Yeah, okay. Brazil? Oh, okay, okay. And uh, what, what signaling does that use? Is it if it just... It's R2? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know that's, that's uh, super ubiquitous in South America. And of course, there's some mature. Um, what? Oh, it's a headache? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, um, about three years ago, it seemed like almost overnight people stopped installing EM trunks. And I almost cried because I was so happy I, had, I didn't have to support that anymore. All right, so. 
Uh, going back to what I was originally saying about uh, not best practice, but just a recommendation we typically make for when you're installing Asterix for the first time. First of all, use a vanilla version of Asterix. So install from a tarball or add the repos provided by the community um, if, it, if it works with your, um, your particular flavor of Linux. And, and install all of these packages. Uh, Dottie and the libpri package. libpri, by the way, it's just a library that um, is super tiny, so not uh, not a big investment as far as space or time. That, as you can probably guess, provides uh, ISDN capability. And uh, one thing that people uh, may not guess right away is if you use BRI cards. Um, like the Digium BRI card, and there's also a hybrid BRI and analog card that we make. The BRI capabilities provided by libpri as well. Okay, so just this library kind of takes care of that. So it's a super tiny library, and again, our rule of thumb is while you're at it, just install all three. A couple of K memory for the libpri, and the Dotty package again, we just say. I think my box just locked up. So it's going really slow. I'm going to leave it there for a second. Um, you can still see it, right? Okay. Welcome to Windows. Yeah. Like I said, it's a company machine. If I could, I don't know. Don't get me started. <laughs> Again, installing Dottie, the, the real point of that is just to make sure that you have at least one valid and usable timing source for asterisks. That's going to be really important for, for audio mixing. <laughs> and making sure thing is, things are synced up there. And of course, the asterisk source itself. Oh, you're killing me. You know what? The other thing is I'm actually using OpenOffice on Windows, and OpenOffice, I love open source, tends to, to crash a lot, so. Let me see if, okay, that's working. There we go. Okay, my apologies. Now, um, if you have a, 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 an internet connection, what will happen when you run the, the install script, Asterix will also try and download from downloads.asterix.org uh, a, a sound file or, or sound package. It's a tarball of the default sounds, all recorded by Allison Smith, the lovely voice of Asterix, who you're probably all familiar with. Um, did, does anyone use Allison prompts, like custom recorded? Okay, I wanted to mention that uh, you can have her record your prompts, which I, I recommend because, of course, you know, uniformity. The default asterisk sounds use her voice, so for your company, IVR or other, or other menus, you know, that, that, uh, that voice. Uh, and, of course, she's a professional, so um, I've had her record prompts, and, and her rate is, is pretty good. Um, there's also an extra sounds package that it's just a bunch of sounds that people in the community have contributed. Just, you know, commission her to record them and add them in. Just a bunch of things that you can use to build auto attendance, like uh, her saying uh, days of the week, uh, month, et cetera. There's all sorts of stuff. S the United States, um, cities. Um, so, oh, and there's also a lot of very funny sound files in actually both the default sound package and the, uh, the extra sounds. So I encourage you guys to take a look at that. There's a couple like Allison um, spoofing the uh, um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. She deadpans the lyrics to, to Louie Louie. Um, all sorts of funny stuff. So kind of like some Easter eggs in there. Um, and one thing that's very useful that people don't, are often not aware of, in that package, if we go to the sounds directory, Okay, so what you see is uh, the, the, the sound packages, and you can, again, you can download these yourself from downloads.asterix.org. The, the name of the tarball will be indicative of the, the type, if it's core sounds or extra sounds, and then the language, E-N here for English, there's, there's a number of different languages, I think. Um, there's French and Spanish and, and some others, and I believe um, 
some community members from a number of different areas have uh, been so kind as to provide a number of sounds in their language so that, that you can use those. Um, but what you'll find is a text file that's basically just the, the package name. And if you edit that file, What this has is a list of the file name on the, the left and then the script of what it says on the right. And this is one that isn't Allison. This is a TT Monkeys. Anyone use TT Monkeys? Or TT Monkeys? I can uh, actually, I'll, I'll call that real quick. I'm going to show you this for a reason. This is, uh, yeah, okay. I think we've got a phone registered here. I'm gonna put this on speakerphone. Can y'all hear that? Okay, monkeys literally screaming. Uh, all that to share an anecdote. I used to use TT Monkeys as my default file for initiating calls through call scripts or the originate command on the CLI or um, just the, uh, the console dial option on the CLI, you guys might use that stuff. And uh, I, I would use this very often during troubleshooting. And I would use a test phone to do that. I always would register like an EEX phone. I have a, anyone use the EEXI? You know what I'm talking about? The old EEX ATA DGM used to sell? Yeah. I use an EEXI and uh, connect it to their machine and make my test calls. But I'd be talking to the customer at the same time. And, uh, and I, I noticed people would always be like, what's going on? Are you okay? Like, <laughs> they'd hear the screaming in the background while I'm talking to them, and they get, they, they're like, get disturbed by that. So I had to stop doing that because people were getting scared. So yeah, if, um, if you install both the, the default and the extra sounds, um, if you want to kind of hack together an IVR or an auto tendon based on the already existing myriad sound files, check the, the, those text files and just do a search for um, the phrase or word that you're looking for and, and you can find it. I used to do configura what we called configuration packages for customers. I'd do uh, turnkey PBXs for like small home offices, SMB, you know, 10 user kind of stuff. And what I would typically do is use SOX, the, the audio editor tool typically installed with Linux, to, uh, to, to cut, and cut pieces out of existing Allison prompts and, and piece them together, concatenate those sound files, and make menus for them with just the default sounds. And it would just, it would sound kind of silly, you know, because of the, the, a little bit robotic because it wasn't perfect. But I, I did that all the time and didn't have to commission any, uh, any custom sounds. <clears throat> now, when you, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're installing Asterisk, for the first time, uh, if you have a basic server distro install of, Astro, or of Linux, and you're going to be pretty much good to go. You're going to have uh, GCC. You're going to have a compiler, and uh, you know the, the autoconf and the other build tools that you're going to need to to uh, to get Asterix itself running. But what I want to show you, besides these fundamental uh, libraries, and uh, tools that um, Asterix itself might need uh, to install or to compile. All of the other capabilities, like different channel drivers, oh, that should work. Uh, can, can you change the size, or do you have to restart the uh, restart the session? Dang. All right. I don't want to mess with that now. I'm not going to waste you guys' time. I'll do. I'll uh, I'll change the size of it. Turn the next break. In fact, okay. if I run over, remind me lunchtime. Twelve. Um, yeah, so during the break, I'll, I'll actually change that, and we can go look at the make menu select. But what I wanted to show you is that when you're in that uh, 
that little end curse is GUI for a particular module, um, if you cannot compile it, uh, it'll show you why at the bottom of the screen it'll list the, the various dependencies for that particular package. So if it, if it need, like, like speaks, if there's, um, you have to download speaks independently from another website and have that installed properly in your system before you can install uh, the speaks codec um, in Asterix, it'll tell you. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. And uh, we'll look at that after the break. But again, you, know, you can install Asterix one of uh, three common ways. We're going to look at installing from a, from a tarball. And we, we prefer that you, you download those tarballs just directly from uh, asterisk.org. And there's a mirror at uh, digium.com, same difference. And uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Subversion, you have it, Subversion installed. Actually, if you go to the developer section of the website, it explains how to install and the basics of using Subversion. Um, you know, of course, if you're a developer and actually going to do any contribution to the community, you'll likely already know plenty about SVN, but um, it'll show you how to run a basic SVN checkout of a particular branch of Asterix, like SVN checkout of uh, 16218 or the, uh, the development branch right now for Asterix 10. And, and again, I, I want to make sure that you guys are aware of that in case you're having a problem that is resolved by an identified bug, so you don't have to wait till there happens to be a point release provided by the community. You can get it. Uh, at that point, so just be aware of that. The, uh, the naming uh, convention we use for these source tarballs is uh, the major version, 1.4, and like 1.8 you see for asterisks here. Uh, up until now, we released asterisk 10, so it's going to be different. And in fact, I don't even know uh, if that's been identified yet, how they're going to do the, the naming of the uh, consecutive uh, additions to Asterix for point release for um, bug fixes or the other uh, releases for security fixes. So that's going to be something i got to figure out. But what you'll see in the other versions is uh, if you replace X, like that's going to be a point release uh, provided for a number of different bugs. And you'll see uh, the bugs that are applied or, or fixed in uh, the change log in uh, the root level of the Asterix source. So I'll show you that real quick. I like to point out the difference here. There's the changes file and then change log, and they're very different. If you look at changes, oh, <laughs> you'll notice that this. If if you're installing Asterix for the first time, or again, if you're using Asterix more superficially using a GUI and you're not typically used to installing Asterisk, um, do reference readme seriously best practices .txt. This is a good file that will uh, familiarize familiarize you with some of the pitfalls in Asterix, some common security mishaps, uh, things that people do like in the dial plan that can create fall through loops where you get really undesirable behavior and, uh, and it's very insecure and people can use your box for toll fraud and you know a lot of different things like that. So do, uh, do take a moment to read that. Um, that reminds me actually, I, uh, I kind of uh, glossed over the the dense comments in those sample configuration files. The, con the comments uh, in extensions.conf and sip.conf in particular are very valuable. So that's actually something I would recommend if you haven't already sit down and actually read it from start to finish. Uh, the the, the sip.conf, in fact, if you look in the source directory, there's a, a directory here you see configs. And this is where the sample config comes from. So if you look at this directory, all of those config files are in this format, blah.conf.sample. So if you make, like we're going to do in our demos, a, a blank or empty config file and kind of start from scratch, or if you accidentally blow away your configuration where you have been adding to the sample config, just know that, that that's where this comes from in the, in the configs directory. So if we take a look at, sip, oops, what am I doing? sip.conf.sample, the documentation here in the comments is well structured and is in these discrete sections like how to name your devices, things to look out for, things not to do, like naming the device, the, the, the number to dial it, like 
um, if this phone was extension 6000, naming it 6000 would be a very bad idea uh, for, for a number of reasons, including security issues. And then you've got sections on like uh, RTP. Come on, so much stuff in here. There you go, TLS settings, SIP timers, RTP stuff. T38, on and on. So the way that this uh, file is structured, it's dense, but uh, very valuable information here. So give it a look, see if you haven't already. Likewise with the um, extensions.conf. Uh, extensions.conf.sample explains uh, very accurately how to create um, proper pattern matches and all of the special characters in the dial plan, like uh, the asterisk, or rather the dot, an exclamation point. So, okay. Hmm. Yeah. Why is it? Going back real quick to the changes file. If you look at changes proper, there's going to be the difference between the previous version and this version. So, um, You'll see subsections here at the top, just the stuff that's been added. And sometimes the documentation of what's been changed, like if there's options added, or uh, there's a fundamental architectural change, or sometimes the changes that really bug people where um, an application replaces a function or vice versa. Sometimes there's a little bit of gray area. Like I said, it's typically supposed to be pretty discreet where an application affects a channel and a function gets or sets data. But sometimes when you're talking about like accessing the Asterix database where you, you can store like registrations for your SIP endpoints or where Asterix does that natively, um, there'll be a uh, disagreement in the community about should that be an application or a function. And from version to version, that'll change and that'll be documented here. And it's a good idea to check that out if you're upgrading your Asterix version so that you can apply all the changes relative to your dial plan um, to neglect that can result in some, some very unfortunate things like your dial plan not working, which is a problem for your phone system. And then again, the, cha oops, excuse me. the change log file shows the actual patches and what they fixed here. So this is, this is coming from the, the bug tracker. So if you wanted to confirm, for example, that the point release uh, includes the patch that you're looking for that fixes your problem, you can, you can check there. Again, if, if that point release hasn't been rolled out yet, you can uh, check out the subversion branch, the current subversion branch, or identify a particular uh, revision number that you want to check out. What else? Oh yeah, again, for reference, when you're talking about what's changed from version to version, check out the upgrades file. This, you can kind of step through um, what this naming convention here is, is uh, this, we're looking at the asterisk source for 185. So what this file will show us is what I would need to change moving from 16x to 18 to be current and my uh, configuration will be uh, applicable. So there's all sorts of stuff in here. So when you download the source for the first time, Again, the tarball will be in this format, version, and then you get the major version number here, and then subversions, dot tar, dot gz. Tar, for those that don't know or are not used to Linux, a, a tarball is a, is a basic archive, and it's uncompressed. It's just, you know, globbing a bunch of files together. And then gz is GNU zip, so uh, that's where it's compressed. And to uncompress that, we'd run tar dash zxvf. It's our ball name, uncompresses it all. And then you can, you can go into the asterisk directory, and that's where you're going to have all that stuff that we were just looking at. So um, the source itself, as well as documentation, the config files. There is a, a doc directory, but I think most of that stuff has been moved to the wiki now. So there's some basic stuff in here, but 
that's a, that's a good thing to be aware of. You've got your inline help and all else. I hope you have an internet connection because all of the, the, um, the documentation that used to be here in a tech format where you could build a PDF or a HTML from like in like 162 asterisk is no longer here. So just be aware of that. Ooh, okay. The, the order that you compile these packages is important. Now, again, you don't necessarily have to install asterisk with the, the recommended packages, libpri and dotty, but if you do, those are going to be dependencies to asterisk. But for asterisk to be able to build the chan dotty channel driver, it needs to know about, uh, about dotty. Dotty needs to exist on the system. So, uh, rule of thumb compile libpri and dotty first. And the order does not matter relative to each other here, so libpri does not actually have to be before dotty, but as long as both of those are compiled before you start compiling asterisks, you're gonna be good to go. Now, uh, a quick walkthrough for installing from source. Again, what you do is uh, untar the tarbar, tarball, like we just did. Go back there. Okay, step one. Now I've got the asterisk source uncompressed. And then you run configure. This will confirm the, uh, the environment and set it up to, to build for that environment based on you know, the hardware architecture and uh, the dependencies. So um, I mentioned you, know, you have to, some basic requirements like having GCC, the, the GNU C compiler on the machine. If that wasn't there, I mean, it's going by pretty, pretty fast, but one of the things it's checking for is that it's on the machine, and it would stop at that point and, and let you know that it's, it's missing, and you could just you know, install from your, uh, your package manager. Okay, we're good to go. From here, you can just run make to compile it, and that's gonna compile you know, the default stuff in asterisk. Um, or you can run make menu select, we'll look at that after the break. And and then you can go in and, and use a nice little menu to pick what you want to install. Um, again, I mentioned there's a couple reasons why you want to do that. Having a, a reduced uh, footprint, you know, not, you know, not compiling everything that you're totally not going to use. If you're only going to use it for uh, SIP installation, then don't install eeks. There would be no point to do that. But in particular, I always recommend that for security purposes. You know, if you install eeks and you also go ahead and make samples, to install all those uh, commented sample configuration files, then what's gonna happen is it's going to add those trunks I mentioned Okay, so we've got some uh, accounts here and I think there's a guest account, yeah. And if an account, whether it's a trunk or a phone, does not have a password set, which would be actually using the option secret. That's a bad password, but you get the point. Um, what that assumes is that it's insecure and won't challenge for a password. So with the default installation, you've got uh, an open, unchallenged guest account on the machine. So it just, I mean, it's, there's security issues, you know, having that uh, protocol listening on that port for no good reason. And you guys likely have seen all sorts of scripts running against your box where you see registration attempts, you know, 1001, 1002, just trying to, you know, uh, get a response from a, a typical um, extension number and then uh, try and brute force the password you know, is the password a, uh, uh, the same as the extension? Is it, you know, test? Is it password? So, um, of course, there's going to be a couple of talks here, uh, and there often are, at AstroCon about uh, SIP security. Um, has anyone had that problem happen? Uh, you know, toll fraud, thousands of dollars of toll, yeah? And uh, 
Does anyone use um, anything in addition to asterisks besides, you know, typical firewall rules like, uh, um, what's that script? I, it's totally fail to ban. Fail to ban. Yeah, thank you. Um, you saw you guys using fail to ban. Yeah, it helps out a lot. I hope. I know it's a, uh, it's a, it's an ongoing discussion in the community. Uh, and one of the things I think uh, architecturally that they're adding to Asterix 10 to to have a better um, native security capability in Asterix instead of having to to cobble together a bunch of different things and sort of reactively apply security to your machine, like fail to ban does. I mean that's you know it's helpful, but it's not perfect. Um, again, as long as you, you don't even have the protocol available, then there's no security issue with EECS, right? So just keep that in mind. Dang. Keep doing that. Okay. So we can either run just make by default, or we can run make menu select to pick and choose what we want to include in asterisks, whether we want to add you know, uh, USB radio driver that might not be installed by default or any, any other exotic stuff, or again, trim it down for security reasons. And then once you've run make menu select, then you can go ahead and go back and run, run make. I'm going to run that and then move away because it's going to take a while. But you see it start, starts compiling based on the options you've, you've specified, the, uh, the different modules, which will go to user lib asterisk modules when we do make install. You saw that come up here, say, it's already been built, run make install, and that's just a script that puts everything in the right place. So, There you go, it's just copying things over. It should just take a second. Okay, and here we go. It says you, you can make samples to make the sample configuration. Um, and one last thing you can do that I recommend, uh, and it's sort of counterintuitive because make samples makes the configuration files. Make config will install some init scripts on the machine so that asterisks will start uh, automatically on boot. And so, can do rest, rest. Um, safe asterisk is installed. Yeah. So this, um, oh, it's already running. Safe asterisk gets installed. And this is sort of a watchdog script where if you initialize asterisk by either um, addressing the binary directly or, um, let's see. We have Dottie stuff. So. Yeah, okay. Okay, so if you do service asterisk stop, okay. Just take a second. Um, I think we did this earlier with Dottie as well, so let me try that, see if it works. Service Dottie stop. Okay, see? So you can run these scripts and it'll, it'll do everything for you. If you watch, um, I mentioned there's a number of Dottie tools um, that come with that package. Uh, just service Dottie start. This should load the, uh, by default, it'll, it'll try and load pretty much every driver that comes with a package. You can edit the modules file to, uh, to pare that down. But you see at the end here, it runs a tool called Dottie CFG. That's the Dottie configurator. And that will apply the options that you've set in, in Etsy Dottie system.conf to the hardware. And then you can go and, and apply your changes to asterisk. But we'll do that. We'll start asterisk that way. Service asterisk start. OK, so instead of. If we start asterisks, make sure it's stopped. OK. Just, it's in our path as root here. We start asterisk, 
just return us to a bash prompt and then we can connect to asterisk like so. We instead run service asterisk start. That's going to run asterisk with um, with uh, the safe asterisk script instead, so that if asterisk dies for some reason, it'll try and restart it automatically for you. So, uh, of course, sometimes, uh, and maybe some of you guys have seen this, the safe asterisk script can be a pain because um, it's it's dying as it tries to start, so it'll just be stuck in a loop. Has anyone seen that happen before? Yeah, that, that can be obnoxious. Um, okay. I think that's it, yeah. So to review the, the steps for asterisks, now it's gonna be different if you're compiling other stuff like libpri and Dottie. There, you don't have to run configure, but uh, in the source directory, we first run configure, then make or optionally make menu select. If I can spell right. Make install. And then optionally, you can do make samples to, to make those uh, sample configuration files that are commented that'll go in the Etsy asterisk directory. Remember, those come from the source in the configs directory. So if you need to check those out for reference, and then make config, we'll install those init scripts so that, again, asterisk will start on boot. And uh, likewise with Dottie. It's the same commands. If we, if we go to the Dottie source, it would just be make config again. All right. Like I said, the, uh, the command to run here for um, untarring and, and unzipping at the same time those tar balls is tar-zxvf. You just maybe just want to memorize that if you haven't used that before. That's uh, z to unzip it or you know, un, uh, ungzip it, x to extract, v for verbose, so you can see all that output that we saw scrolling on the screen, and then f for file name. So what's going to happen is um, you give it the file name here and it's going to create, oops, create the directory of the same name. So you saw um, our tarball asterisk dash 1.8.5.0, and it created a directory of the same name. And then I can go in there and compile a source. So again, if you're gonna follow the, the rule of thumb there, install in this order, libpri and Dottie before asterisk. And uh, those compiled relatively quickly. If you're gonna compile asterisk, um, Without selecting any options, we'll do a clean and try and make again. It'll tr you'll see that it, it compiles every module individually. And it, it, it can, depending on the, uh, the processor or the machine you're running it on, it's going to be pretty slow. See, especially when it hits the channel drivers, it's going to it's going to take several seconds to compile. So I can leave this, and it might take you know like three or four minutes easily. So remember that if you have an internet connection and you and you run make install towards the end, um, and if we were to, to just watch that screen and wait a couple minutes, you'll see that it tries to connect to downloads at uh, asterisk.org and download the default sounds package. Now, if we go to downloads.asterisk.org, again, we've got the sounds in a number of different formats or codecs and languages. Okay, see, there's, there's tons of them. You can download those directly yourself. Just uh, copy and paste, down, click to install, or wget from the, the terminal. Or in Make Menu Select, you can choose the sound prompts to install as well. And you don't have to install one particular uh, format. You can install as many as you want. That can be beneficial uh, to, to avoid transcoding. When Asterisk plays back uh, sound files, it'll play back the file that is the least cost to transcode. So if you've got an incoming call that's G711, and you have the, the file format G711, 
it'll, it'll choose that file so it doesn't have to, to waste CPU transcoding it for no reason. In fact, um, if we look at the syntax, you saw the example for TT monkeys earlier in the dial plan. Don't worry about the syntax, by the way. We're going to look at the, the dial plan in, in some, some depth here. But we specify the file name, TT monkeys, and we don't give it an extension. Asterisk will complain and it'll actually fail if we try to use a ex um, file extension. So just for the sake of example, if I put in uh, .gsm here, and I, as I said, you know, recommendation always have the CLI up and you can see the errors and warnings. I'm going to call, oops, dial plan reload to apply the changes. I'm going to call that again and you should see it fail and say that it doesn't like that. Oh, and well, in this case, it's failing because they don't have that sound file, but if it was there, it would say that you should do that. So, get as many sounds as you want, depending on what, uh, what codex you're using externally. This is a review, again, of what we just looked at on the, on the CLI. Um, in full for asterisks to, to compile start to finish. Untar the tarball. Whoops, sorry, I keep doing that. Enter that directory, for those who aren't used to uh, Linux CLI or um, shell, that's the CD command followed by the directory name. And then you have to run dot slash configure, make or make menu select, that's optional. Then make install, that's the bare minimum. Then asterisks will be there and uh, you can also make samples and make config or make make documents. Any questions about the installation process? Anyone new to that and, and uncomfortable with it? Okay. Like I said, if there's dependencies that are missing, some core capability like the compiler, it'll pretty much uh, give you a straightforward message indicating what's lacking. So you can download it. Um, and again, if you look in the Make Menu Select, I'll bring that up after, after the break, it will, it'll show at the bottom of the screen um, a number of packages that, in fact, so for example, if there's a particular module that you want to build an asterisk, if there's more than one dependency, all the dependencies that need to be met to build that module will be listed on the bottom of the screen. So it's pretty helpful. Uh, this is not uh, comprehensive. That's not everything, but this is pretty much where everything will be installed on the file system. Again, this stuff will be uh, there for reference in asterisk.com, so you don't have to, to memorize this, and we're not going to go through all of that. But um, we've already looked at the, the modules directory. That's the, the core capability of asterisk, where all those shared objects live. And then varlib asterisk sounds and varlib asterisk moh, moh for music on hold. And there are default uh, sound files provided for you. There you go. And those are, uh, I believe they're under a Creative Commons license, so they're freely distributable, um, at least in the US. I think they um, should be good to go um, anywhere else in the world. And so you, the, these uh, replaced actually some of the free play uh, sound files or other music files that were available in earlier versions of Asterix that might have had some uh, licensing issues in certain countries. So if you're using those old files and you've, you've upgraded Asterix and haven't installed these, it might be a good idea just to make sure that you're safe to, to use these files. And you can go and download other Creative Commons freely distributable uh, music files. Um, FYI, I mean, just to, uh, something we always want to point out, of course, um, it's not a good idea to use MP3s that you've ripped on your own because, you know, that's illegal. Don't be a pirate. I think we're real close to lunchtime. It's about two till, so um, let me see if there's any other directory that's real important. Oh, uh, the var spool asterisk is where we'll, and uh, we'll actually look at this when we, we start adding. There's a couple of applications that build voicemail functionality where you can go to check and administer your voicemail capability, 
as well as the, the asterisk application for leaving voicemail. Um, and that will, uh, will, will add voicemail users to voicemail.conf. And then we could take a look at the file system here. Under vo var spool asterisk, there'll be uh, subdirectories built for those particular users. And then there's a tree under there where um, it'll have the different sound prompts for that user, like the busy message, the user's name, et cetera. Um, so we'll take a look at that actually in a little bit. Um, we already looked at uh, on a Red Hat flavor. This is CentOS, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Once you do make config, of course, you can uh, initialize asterisks using the service asterisk stop, start, and restart. And again, that's a good idea to do that so that um, actually, it'll, uh, again, it'll start safe asterisk, so it'll, it'll restart it for you. Hopefully, asterisk uh, won't, won't crash, of course, but if it does, it'll restart it. And uh, okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll take a break. And when we come back, I'll show you the, the, the make menu, uh, select menu briefly. And then we're going to look at a couple of the common arguments to the asterisk binary, uh, different uh, things like you saw me using, like R, X, C, and, and why those are useful.